I'm quite happy to have the chance to present here a little bit of our work and also the topic, and also that so many people are quite interested in it. Uh, I hope that everybody can see the screen now, so and the slides. Um, actually, the title, as already told, is how can we integrate robots in agriculture and crop production. And therefore, I started to grab a little bit into what we, we did in our department for research for robots in the last years. Um, therefore, actually, the outline for today is, uh, or for the webinar is, first about the introduction, why we do it in general. So, a little bit, uh, a small talk about our department. Um, and I want to go directly in the problem description. Why is it, in a way, complicated to integrate a robot in robots in crop production automation, and then also go a little bit more into automation processes. Then, in general, I want to talk on different topics, what we also um, use in our department for different research parts. How can we use pre-planned routes in robots for different parts? How can we use sensors for optimizing the efficiency? Um, then we'll afterwards have some time for questions, as already told. And then I want to go a little bit more into more fut futuristic parts. So how can we minimize machine size and impact? And what are applications for small machines, really small machines fitting into crop rows? And then as last point, I want to talk a little bit about some research what we do here for uh, optimizing traction and interaction forces for the machines. So for everybody who is not familiar with Hohenheim, what is maybe not so um, so famous uh, for everybody, um, we come from Germany, um, as you see in the middle um, of Europe, and there we are based in the south, actually here in the um, city of Stuttgart, in the suburbs of Stuttgart, what is a quite nice place, so if somebody wants to come and join um, our research group. We're always happy to have new people working on, on, on robots and everything else. So we are based in uh, an old castle, what we have here, um, what was the oldest agriculture um, department or university for agriculture in Germany. And it was actually, it was built up, uh, sorry, it was built up um, because of a lot of uh, starvation, what was in the, um, started in 1816 and was funded, founded in the year of 1818. So we have now more than 200 years um, the University of Hohenheim is existing. Well, our department is based for um, agriculture um, parts and we are in the Institute of Agriculture Engineering. Um, our department is uh, called technology and crop production, and we are basically focusing in general about developments and concepts for automation, robotics, and precision farming. And um, also, we want to promote sustainable and effective crop production systems. So, research is basically intercooperative and interdisciplinary on different parts. So, we have to work on, on existing machines. We have um, basic technology in agriculture and on the other side we have also new technology like robots and um, image analysis or anything what you can think about of IoT. So um, yeah, and this, uh, I come out of this background so I myself um, I studied mechatronics so I have more in background engineering but I did my PhD here in Hohenheim basically on robots for agriculture. So let's go a little bit more to the topics. Um, actually, in agriculture, as maybe most of you know, we have a lot of big machines. As, as bigger the fields are and as more we go into crop production, uh, we have really big machines. Sometimes it can be more than 40 tons what the machines are um, trying to weight. And this is also kind of the reason because we want to have one person doing as much work as possible in, in less time. And therefore, uh, the machines have to get bigger and bigger, and at least as big as possible. At least in Europe, we have the problem that the machines cannot get any bigger because it's hard to transport them from field to field. So as you have to cross the streets, um, then you have some law regulations and limits. Um, where we come from technology to an end. So this will not go any further, at least if we want to improve the systems. So, and also these machines have some big issues. So first of all, there's safety. Um, this is definitely not a safe place what is 
a guy is sitting in here um, on the left side. So in general, also we have to get these machines really effective because they are quite quite expensive. So we have not much time to in, in the year sometimes, and that's the reason why these big machines um, work on each possibility, at least for harvest parts. And this also causes a lot of problems for soil compaction and also environmental issues. As the title already mentioned, we believe that one option or like one change in this paradigm can be that we use robots in the future. In general, you could say um, there are many different ways how we could use robots. It could be in one way like a, a moving vehicle, what is just using conventional ways to spray in, in a wine yard or using um, different tools for weeding or anything else. Or like if you think really futuristic, maybe we have in future drones doing the harvesting way or like transport, uh, doing the transportation between the parts. Who knows? Actually, I don't know. I, th I think anybody who tells or, or says he knows it um, is not true because we, um, the future will tell. And it's really depending how uh, the technology will develop in future. And But I think it will be a really interesting next 10 years, maybe 20 years, when robotics is coming more and more into agriculture. In general, a robot, maybe uh, I took this small robot Wally because I really like the movie and also it's a nice example of a, a really mobile and uh, attractive performing robot um, that this robot has to know actually where it is, how is the close environment and also where are the objects of interest. So we can say this uh, or conclude this in a way like that we need perception. This could be in this way like camera system or and also on the other part we need context awareness. So we have to know where what is around, how to interact with these parts in, in the environment and how the robot can deal with it in a way. But this is not always easy. So everybody who works on robots knows that there are several issues, what can happen in, um, in programming a robot, what was not planned before, as you saw here in the coffee, coffee cup, or here you see a small example um, of robots failing in their tasks, what they were programmed for. So this happens at least for every, um, at least for, uh, for sure when you try something out, and this I think is always um, a big issue, and also it gets more complicated as more parts we have. And as soon as we have humans involved, this is definitely not acceptable when the robots are failing or really harming somebody. And this is also a reason why maybe in future we don't have to think so much about small robots as about big robots and automation, but maybe more about small robots what cannot do so much harm to other people. Yeah, the robots could enable a sustainable agriculture for sure, but the machines need context awareness to be fault tolerant and reliable. So this is definitely not easy to reach, and this is um, definitely one reason what was also um, defined by other authors, um, what you see here, that we have one big issue, what is really different in agriculture domain, that we have unstructured environment and unstructured object, what we have to deal with. So, and this is definitely unique also to other domains where we use robotics right now, or we hope to use robotics in the future, um, that we have here definitely like two areas what are, can be quite changing over the time. It's not just an environment where we have to, uh, have to go through, but also um, the objects, what we have to deal with can change from, uh, from, from day to day, sometimes from, uh, from month to month or even whatever um, you want to do. Like if you think about fruits or anything, handling with fruits, they have different uh, shapes and sizes. Or if you think about plants, they, when they start growing, they look completely different than if you have them uh, in, uh, in a later stage. But let's start maybe a little bit more to the basics. Uh, when we think about processes and options for automation, um, the easiest way to do something in agriculture is to use pre-planned tools. So we have RTK, GNSS, like, um, satellite systems, what we can use for precise navigation in under ideal conditions. You can get a precision of two and a half centimeters just for, um, for refining a point. 
Um, and we can use sensors for optimizing the efficiency, like using row folding, harvesting camps, or any, anything else like this. But um, the problem is with these big parts that we have a safety issue and also several parts. So definitely there is a, a reason to minimize the machine size and impact, at least to the, to the size where we can still do the work and have enough range for the machines. Um, and also we have a lot, a lot of more options maybe afterwards that we can drive between rows, do data acquisition, scouting and monitoring. It's depending really what is the use for the different machines. And then afterwards, like when we downsize machines, we also have to think about other parts. So as soon as you downsize the machines, we get problems with traction, interaction forces, and the machines, how they behave under different occasions, what really can change to in, in compared to a big machine. So this means also that we have to minimize energy input, optimize processes, and hopefully get a fully autonomous robot on the field, what it doesn't have to get many errors while performing its work. The easiest way is to just use an automated instructor. So this is one research part what we did already in the 2000s, something like this. So the easiest way is to, when we think about mechanical weeding. So we uh, think about here is a, is a normal tractor system but, um, where we have a localization um, system on it. And also we can have a localization system on the hoe and the part so that we can exactly localize where is our um, working tool and where is our robot driving or in this part, this tractor. And we can use this to just put waypoints to the machine and say just move from point A to point B. And this already helps to perform many tasks what we have right now in agriculture. Like if, when you think about the basic use in agriculture, we can already automate a lot of parts for that. In this way, it's for mechanical weeding. Um, you see here the example of the robot. You have the two parts of the um, GNSS antennas, and the back part, the normal hoe, is also able to do a side shift to it. Actually, with this, we can do a lot. So when you think about the crop rows like this, what are planted in many parts, and think about the red crosses as wheat, we just uh, put a hoe between it, it already helps to remove almost 90% of the weeds. So in many cases, there are just some weeds left between uh, the plants. So when we do intra-row weeding, we could remove them also. But in general, already this brings a high benefit for the plant. When we change also the pattern, how we plant uh, um, the single um, single plants in our, our, um, our field, we can even do a crossing. So more or less like when we think about a field with the red um, crosses as the weeds, we can use uh, drive the hoe in two ways, one from up and uh, one from the left and one from the upside. So and there you see already almost 99% of the weeds were removed. So when you do this precisely already with this method, you can do really a lot. But this also means that you have to change the way how you uh, do the planting and also the strategy. This is one example of, um, I think it was in 2004 or 2002, something between that, um, with the autonomous structure Hackle performing at um, RTK-based navigation for hoeing and mechanical weeding. You see that the system has its waypoints, it's moving directly over into the crop row, lowering down the mechanical tool, and it works quite well in a way. Uh, to perform the task that was, uh, at least in this case, um, part of the method. The problem with this method is that when we use RTK-based navigation, we need a route planning before. So it's not possible to do this online, or in many cases, um, that the uh, system is designing itself. So we have to know exactly where are the plants um, planted and or proceeded and where the robot is allowed to move. Maybe it doesn't have even an obstacle detection or anything else. So in general, we have to do the route planning before and we go with the robot to work and the intelligence comes from outside the machine. So there is no context awareness for the machine. It's just an operating system actually, like a machine. Uh, this brings also a lot of safety issues 
and definitely needs some different tools or security um, or safety uh, devices like security brake or um, based on a leader a system or a bumper what we have in front so that the system can operate and perform autonomously also in a safe way. Sure, they will come directly to the next point. So maybe we don't need just a point-to-point -point navigation and we can use this to um, use different kind of camera sets. This is uh, another robot what we have in our department. It's called Phoenix robot, uh, which was built in our department. It's a caterpillar robot with uh, 10 kilowatts of um, power with electrical, completely electrical turbine and can perform work about eight hours. Um, this is one example of um, sensor array what we installed on the on the machine with several cameras we used uh, GoPro cameras for um, first of all for image analysis and also for um, photogrammetry and 3D point cloud registration then we used the famous Kinect camera for for low cost uh, time of flight as, um, assistance um, also for point cloud and 3D point cloud registration. Then we have a leader system at a part um, just for, um, for distance detection and road following in wine yards or in, in crop rows. And um, also like um, a basic device what we have here in agriculture. Um, this is, um, is a cons um, like a conventional uh, camera what system what you can buy already. So we integrate this in our robot. We have a row following algorithm behind it. Um, it's the glass camera, what is, you can also buy for you, you combined harvester or any tractor, what you want to do, um, auto road following. Um, the easiest way to perform already kind of an um, environment detection or something else is that um, you can just use a camera system. So we also invest in this part, how can we use a camera to detect crop rows and use this afterwards for, first of all, detect weeds and single parts, and also in the easy way, also to guide um, the implement in the back part. So when we have this in a complete system, we can use this also in our robot. So this is um, one example um, for mechanical weeding with the Phoenix robot. We have at the back part a shifting device. Um, what is, um, like we have the camera and the camera array in the front part, and there is detecting the crop rows and following this crop row and the hole at the back part will lower down as soon as it sees the crop rows and it will try to hold the, um, because we have a caterpillar robot to shift the, um, the hole exactly in the middle of the row so that we have less losses as possible and this already helps you to, to move at least in a centimeter level accuracy to the crop rows, you're also depending a little bit on the crop stage and, and the crow stage in the part. Uh, my colleague sees here, uh, he really likes it, so in a way, um, performed quite well. Um, this is actually a quite simple example of how, how it can work. Um, and this is also, I would call it state of the art, it's just a question if a company wants to sell it. So, um, it's easy to, to accomplish it. You can, can buy tools for that or they are commercially available. And uh, if you build a robot in this size, it's um, maybe still, still um, you need some, have some security issues. So there's several power behind it. So it weighs something about 500 kilograms. But in general, when you have an area or like a field where um, it's, you can create kind of a fence around or you can really define that nobody will um, enter under different circumstances who's not allowed to work there. Um, this already helps a lot to um, ensure security for robots. So actually this is definitely possible to integrate this in agriculture in the future. But there are also other different options. Maybe there are um, several guys of you already know that there are many tools for agriculture to, to in uh, intra-crop weeding, also with mechanical tools. So, and also this one investigation, what I want to show to you, this is also one option, what was uh, developed in our um, department or part of our department. So this was actually just um, implement for a normal tractor or for an autonomous tractor with the HACO truck. 
And this is like the basic part that you can also now use the camera system to detect the single plants and then use the single plants or like, and then detect where do we have to um, put out our tool for weeding between the plants and use this for um, also weed the last remaining weeds between um, the single crops. In our case, we used um, um, Cyclos uh, hoe in a way, it's a special tool, I will show you later. And um, it will create kind of a special movement around um, the crop row. Uh, when nothing is, uh, when it when it's in, in, in the right way, so that it directly moves into the middle, nothing changes. But as soon as we um, would hit exactly the plant, then it can move out of the crop row, and this helps already to um, remove the losses. This is how it would look like in a way. So this is attached now to a, a normal conventional tractor, um, and there you see like how it performs in a way. So we can use this with first of all, to detect the single plant image analysis, or when we have a really precise um, navigation system, we also can use already RTK positions to do the weeding. So when we exactly know where are the spots, this already would be possible. Another example um, is um, the weeding also between um, or in vineyards or also in, in orchards. So this is uh, one example what we also build it up. So as we have at the back part of the robot, we have a, um, a shifting um, attachment. So we can um, create kind of a rotary reader at the back part and use different sensors to detect um, objects. Like in this case, it will not work with, with small plants, but if you think about um, a tree or anything else, it already could help to read between the trees. So. Um, this is actually all. So actually, we were at this example, so we have here now the, um, the example for weeding between um, between trees or some um, some vineyards. So in this case, we can use also a, a leader system for detecting crop rows or detect, uh, or following a row. Um, we have this in the front here. Um, the basic principle behind it is that. We have like a time of life system, and out of this, we just detect the horizontal points what are leftovers. As you see here on the left upper parts, this is um, um, the, the ROS based system, what you see here in, the, in, um, in Iris with their graphical tool. And here you see different um, plots in the middle, what we can use afterwards for navigation. So, an, an actually, quite easy algorithm what you can use is just to um, to filter out the, the plant points and then create with a um, with a, um, a ransack algorithm to evaluate uh, a line where you have to follow, and then you can just define an offset of the robot where you have to follow, and this you can use for navigation of the robot system. In this case, we use two different sensors. One's a feeder, where you just um, take the Take, take a hit to the, to the tree, and as soon as, as the feeder is um, attached, um, the, um, the system will move out. And the other one was like that we used a sonar sensor to just detect when is the tree or just trunk coming, and then and move out the system to query. Here's one example how we used it. We have um, a nice indoor hall, what we can use for, um, for testing different devices. Um, there you see how system moves in and out. So uh, the good thing about robot is also that we can um, go much slower well, as with a conventional farming tool. Um, when you think about when you do something like this with, um, with a normal tractor, the farmer is just interested in how fast can I drive. So um, as soon as we have an autonomous system, this is not necessary anymore. So um, there's just a question about effic efficiency and how long yes, we can perform the work. So. In general, when we do it right, the robot is able to perform 24 hours a day, or at least um, from charging period to charging period. And this already helps to, um, maybe also in future, to improve different kind of environmental setups. So uh, when we went outside, it was a little bit more problematic, and sometimes worked, sometimes not. Anyhow, this is still ongoing research. 
but it shows quite good uh, the possibilities what we have with robots in future. Um, also, the options to change paradigms what we have um, built it up in agriculture for several years, or maybe sometimes um, centuries. Um, we can change now because it's not so much more about efficiency, and we can change um, more about the, bio um, the biology of the plant. So it's more important how does the plant can grow better, and we can try to investigate how the robots can perform the work afterwards, so that not the humans are doing the work so much. So at this point, I want to do a, a short break and give some room for questions uh, for the first part. Okay, good. So we have, we already have a question. Um, so Johannes said on uh, slide 26, you mentioned Ransack for following the crop rows. To yeah. what extent is this robust against curve rows? So do you use a linear, linear model for the crop row or something more complex? Um, actually, it's quite easy. It's depending. Like when you have um, curved uh, when you have curved rows, um, you have to think about um, how far you look ahead. Actually, so um, the, the tricky part behind using a ransack for row following is always the question: um, how curved are the rows, and how far you have to look ahead to react to it. So in a way, when you look too far ahead and the, the curve is too, too short, uh, it will just um, eliminate it. So in our case, we use for a crop row detection and in curve rows, we use, um, we just filter out maybe something like um, three or five meters uh, around um, the sides of the robot. So you can just do a box filter around it and then use the run set to estimate where the crop row is going. So um, when you have even higher angles, uh, then you have to go maybe a little bit less uh, to the point. So we also use it in small robots, also in the field robot event, and there it performs quite well, actually. But there we go with uh, different filter settings than with the big robots in Ryanair, for sure. Okay. So it's like locally you think of them as linear. Yes. Well, it's, yeah. it's always a question about how you, um, how you filter out the point cloud. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, second question is: Do you use ROS on all the robots, and are then um, are there any off-the-shelf um, packages that you have found very useful through your work? Uh, yes, we use ROS on all robots actually, um, and there is several uh, packages around what you can use off the shelf. It's really depending what you use. Um, so basically, ROS all the um, brings um, basic support for all the sensors. So this is where you start normally, and as uh, so we have ROS nodes for all sensors, what we used in in the system. Then um, we also use Probomind, uh, parts of it um, for several parts. Um, some packages we programmed ourselves, and. Um, from time to time, we test different packages from, from different um, off-the-shelf packages, um, at least for uh, image analysis. Uh, we didn't use it so much, also not for crop following. They were programmed our own algorithms, but um, for these basic navigation parts, you can use off-the-shelf um, packages for all of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so last... Okay, oh, uh, I forgot to check one other screen. Um, oh, good, so more questions are coming in. Um, so can do you have multiple robots communicating with each other, for example, for mapping and sending information to each other? Yes, we did stuff like that, um, but not with the big robots, actually. So we did some, um, actually, we also have one teaching course for, um, with, uh, for students. And we use uh, small, um, also ROS-based uh, small robots, and there we try out like also the communication between different different systems. How do you um, cooperate with them? But we didn't use it actually on the field for performing um, like different tasks with different robots, or even for communication, or like sharing a task and stuff like this. This is still ongoing work, so um, I hope that uh, we can go a little bit more deep into this details in the future. 
Okay. Um, and then um, I think this is this is going to be the last question for the break, uh, all the attendees. Uh, but keep on, if you have questions, please keep on writing them in. So then when we get to the end, I'll have a, a, a list of questions to ask David. Uh, so this is from Lee. Are there any further suggestions about how to mechanically control re weeds within the crop rows? So, you know, if you wanted to do it again, or if you wanted to alter your designs further, what, what would you do? Wow, that is a good question. <laughs> there, you know, it's like, this is not by, by itself, I would say, like the mechanical part. So, um, so in a way, it's, um, I suggest to, um, yeah, there are many different methods to, to destroy weeds. So, like, also do it in mechanical, we are like using heating or um, using also different kind of um, laser beams or stuff like this. So, we also tested out stuff like this. But the problem is that, uh, you have to be more accurate. So you always have the option to be um, to use um, like a image detection to detect single weeks and then they stride them punctually. Um, but when you go for hoeing or it's like um, just mechanical weeding parts, you don't have to be that precise. So it's much easier to detect um, the plant by itself and then use this afterwards for um, for removing the weeds. Um, in general, it's, I would say, like, yeah, the question is more what kind of soil do you have and what kind of conditions you want to work. So uh, that's something what you have to change individually, I think, for each field or region, for sure. But yeah, that's a good point. I've seen a lot of um, different weeding designs. I've seen the stamper from, uh, I guess, the Bosch yeah. Deep Field Robotics. Yes. There's, there's, yeah. a lot, there's a lot out there. Yes. Okay, yeah. so... Um, We'll let you carry on with the rest of your presentation, and then I'll catch some of these other questions at, at the end. Okay. All right. So next part is um, how can, like, now I talk just about, like, the basic mechanical parts, how this, um, the methods would be used and different robots and weeding parts. So next part is going, how can we minimize machine size and impact? Uh, and also like um, several additional tasks what these small machines can do. Um, as you already uh, maybe met, um, recognized that we talk a lot about weeding and um, also using maybe not so much chemicals and stuff like this, but um, the tasks what I showed until now, they're definitely not possible with a really small robot. And as you see here, like this is a conventional um, tractor we have also with, um, with a hoe at the back part and then our robot Felix, what can maybe perform the same work, but is smaller and doesn't have to, um, the range as a normal tractor have. But the big part is that we don't have to need a human standing beside and doing the work and trying. However, we can even go maybe to even smaller robots. So um, this is um, one example from the free robot event from, from last year. Um, where always a student team of us is participating and that exactly goes for how can we follow crop rows with small, small devices. So it's more about showing um, what is possible and what not. If you think about a robot like this, it is not really possible to pull a mechanical tools. So you have to be much more um, precise what you want to do. So it could be in a way maybe you can do a, a point to point uh, weed detection and then you uh, spray something on it or um, some chemicals on it or um, destroy it punctually. But actually, um, also, a big issue of the small robots is the range. So, in, under normal circumstances, a robot like this maybe lasts with its batteries about two hours, maybe three hours. And when we think now about big fields, um, the robot will be completely lost in the middle, maybe somewhere as soon as the batteries run out. So. When we want to use small robots like this also, we cannot do hard work in a way. So it's a problem about traction, about interaction force. So this makes also sense to use the, them more for monitoring and um, or like data acquisition. One option what we also did in our research is that we um, checked out how can we use a robot or a small robot like this one here um, to grab information from different fields. So. Um, one example could be when we go for IoT that we just place a sensor somewhere in the field with some information what we want to have. Problem is when we have a sensor somewhere in the field, we have two options. Make it really 
big and strong to send it somewhere to um, always send the information online to the, um, to the cloud or we can use really low cost sensors what are doesn't have much battery power but sending a really um, short, uh, short short range signal um, like a CP device but this can last uh, maybe for several years and in the field without any additional um, um, that, um, any additional energy supply and this makes it interesting for big fields but um, one option for a small robot could be then afterwards maybe we can use them to, to gather the information inside the field from uh, a technical device like an IoT system and this is also what we did then so we used it in, in one year we placed uh, several ones in the field so that they are not connected to each other so we cannot create a wireless sensor network but just uh, small spots of information what we have somewhere. And then we just use the robot to, to follow here uh, the basic drop rows, maybe for monitoring and detecting several parts in the field. And then we check out where do we got um, response from the sensor, like wireless connection to the sensors. And this information we could use also afterwards to localize the sensors and then use the robot system to directly drive between this point. So um, the interesting part behind it is in, in a wide yard that um, a small robot doesn't have to follow the crop rows. So um, a small robot really path can pass um, between the rows or through the rows, doesn't matter as, as long as there is enough space, uh, it doesn't have to follow the same pattern as a big, big machine. So this is definitely a big, um, big point what we can use it for. Um, the basic or Interesting part is always like monitoring, crop monitoring, seeing what, how does the plant develop. And therefore, we did also several projects for it. So one is uh, one example that we did here in a greenhouse, actually. Um, and we used um, Trimble uh, Total Station in this way to track exactly down the position of the real position of the robot system to see how can we use different methodologies and sensors on top of the system to um, to get or to gain information. So we put it several laser scanners on the machine and there uh, to connect versions of cameras. And then afterwards we could uh, replay first of all like what, what did we detected. And also we could do this over several periods over the year or like in, in the growth stage. So afterwards we could reassemble the data as you hear in, see here in the Ross environment, so we can just see that the robot is uh, crossing over the field and the different data, as you see here now, is the assembled 2D LIDAR scanner from uh, the tilted one. And we can use this to create a 3D point cloud on the go um, with almost no need for additional software like um, like ICP or any matching devices, however it is. So, in this point cloud, we can afterwards analyze and use it for um, to detecting different um, parts of it. And this was possible because we had um, on top of it um, a small prism, what is directly was um, tracked down by the by the total station. And then we could afterwards with the fixed frame just reassess where are the positions of the sensors and then transform it back to one coordinate system. Therefore, we could do this over several growth stages. So we did the test over, I think, in total six or seven um, different days uh, over three months. So we could see afterwards how the, the plant developed over the time. We had different point clouds over the same time period. And this we could use to make some really nice analysis of our different papers for you know, the road about it. So actually the point was to first of all we had the total station then we got the, uh, the target prism as a positioning system on the outdoor system you could also use rdk or anything else like this maybe a little bit less precise but in general you would have it um, as a positioning system and then we got here an inclined leader scanner a horizontal leader and a vertical leader to just compare how does the different leaders perform um, first of all, for creating point clouds, or how can we detect different um, different objects or different parts of uh, of the plants with different leader scanners? 
And last but not least, also use the Connect on top of it to first of all get um, a point cloud out of it to match it together, and then to compare also afterwards the sensors what to uh, what we can use for them. Most the use for it. Um, this generated point clouds um, represent the 3D environment or the 3D environment what we use there, and uh, actually with this you can already really easily distinguish between soil and plants, what you see here is one, one part, you could use it for just cutting out with a ransack, the ransack plane algorithm, the, the ground points, or use it a little bit more complex that you use the interfere, um, like the, um, yeah, the different lighting conditions of the leader, or use the camera system, where with the Kinect camera, we have also the RGB image and the depth image together, or we can um, fuse together and use this also for um, separating plant points from crown points. With the Kinect, it would look like something like this. And we used a um, basic ICP matching algorithm, a little bit adjusted to our problem. So basic algorithm, almost, almost in all days, um, um, like these basic algorithms normally don't work on agriculture. So we always have to adjust them a little bit. So in this case, we also developed a little bit a new methodology, what is fitting perfectly to the field what we had here. And the um, problem is sometimes also that the matching is not well performed. This is a big issue is that when you pass the rows that the plants are also moving in a little way. So this makes it really hard for, um, for 3D reconstruction in different parts that you are really fitting the same point as the last time. Okay. Um, we used it to compare also how does it um, perform the reconstruction if you just drive through the rows with a robot from different sites, how does the, um, does the accuracy goes up or down depending if you just use one shot or different shots. And, and for the small devices, you see already like in the positions of the sensors what we use that there is high differences if you just pass once in one direction or the other direction. So if you want to get a really good reconstruction of the of the plants, you for sure have to go around the plant or go from two sides um, to detect at least all features. And then afterwards, you can use this for leaf area estimation. This is a basic point. Uh, if you just um, just remove the, po um, the points of the crowns and then use this afterwards to um, to trim it back again. Then you can already use this for estimating the leaf area of the, of the point cloud. Um, this is quite okay from the accuracy. Um, this all they have to do with the leaders and the, and the Kinect scanner, so it's not are the most precise devices, but they are definitely costly enough that you can maybe include it in a, in, in a basic system. Um, or a small robot in a way. So these are some of the results. So we got errors from the hand measurement between the point clouds around 33 to 29%. Um, so we were quite happy with it, um, but we have to admit that maybe also the hand me measurements were not that precise. So um, this can also be a part of the error. Um, everybody who did this kind of hand measurements maybe knows what I'm talking about. This is like you go for each plant, each leaves, and then you measure the length and the, and the width of the leaf, and then you count up how precise you are. And at least when you have the hundreds times the same plant, then you get a little bit annoyed and maybe you are not that accurate as a human anymore than a robot would be. Another common um, methodology for that is um, using photogrammetry. Um, in this case, we also just compare this to these other methods, what we have. Like the other methods are able to perform in live, so we don't have to wait for the results, actually. So we can do this while driving. Um, but when we do photogrammetry, we have to do the analysis and post-processing. So in this case, um, we just assembled the images also from the Kinect, uh, just the RGB images, and then Created out of this a point cloud, what we can use here for each growth states. And there you can see already how this changes over the time. Uh, this is around um, the starting part, is around uh, one month after seeding, roughly, and the last part is um, one month later. So in this case, we had maize in the part. 
And but this also showed quite kind of interesting results. So that you sometimes maybe don't don't have to really reconstruct it, but when you just have to when you just filter out the points with a walk the grid filter, um this already gives um some quite good results over the time to estimate how many plant spines we have. So or how uh, on the area. And this is one was one paper we wrote about it. How can you estimate different plant points in the park? And there we see um, the development of the filtering algorithm going down over the time. So it's depending how much leaf area do you have, and then you have to adjust the leaf area or the filtering to the estimated leaf area. And then you can use this for optimizing the, um, the filtering algorithm afterwards. So maybe sometimes you don't need so complex algorithms for estimating the perfect fit um, on many cases. This is, uh, can be already with a small robot with really easy algorithms already more precise than the human going through um, and counting single leaves, what is definitely not practical for uh, real use on the field. So. Then sure, also on point clouds, we can detect single plants. This is also one part of the detail. So we matched for the point cloud registration uh, three d sensors we used to laser scanner on, and the tilted laser scanner or the inclined laser scanner on the front of the robot. Then we used an IMU to estimate um, the inclination of the robot system to get less errors. And then the total station as tracking and positioning system to see how good we can get the point parts. So this we can use then afterwards to create uh, a point cloud representation of the environment and then use different algorithms for estimating the, um, the single plant. So this is um, two parts what we use. We used um, Euclidean clustering in one part and then also um, iteratively, um, iterative, uh, an iterative method what is using um, the context a little bit into account to get a better precision of it. This is how a point cloud with, uh, um, with a leader scanner would look like in a way. So it is not super precise, as you see, and you have a lot of shattery noise. Um, but it's actually the most precise what we could get out of the laser scanner. And if you think about the precision of, a, of the single beams, like we have a time of life system, and from the manufacturer, we have an accuracy of roughly around two and a half centimeters of precision, how precise we um, get the result. But you see also like that in, on touching the leaves and stuff like this, you get shattering points what can in some parts create a lot of noise in it, what you have to filter out first and then afterwards use this for analysis. But results were, were quite fine. So in this way, um, we saw like, um, this was this, uh, actually the first um, you see here on the point cloud, uh, uh, on the graph, the uh, results from um, one algorithm, this the so-called uh, PCM algorithm for single, single plant detection, if you're interested in it. I can definitely forward you the paper. Um, it's about um, the point cloud started from this point, actually. So the first three plants went up in the point cloud. That's the reason we didn't detect here anything. Um, and um, the, the circles are the ground truth, but we mentioned also the total station is absolute reference of the single plant. And then we see how does the, the plant detection algorithm detects the plant position, how precise it is, and sometimes it's quite accurate, and some others it's not that accurate. Um, but we were quite happy with the results, so, um, but there's definitely a lot of improvement possible in the future. So um, this is definitely a big research area in the future, how to deal with single plants and point clouds and how precise we can get it. Um, on this part, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the robustness of point clouds. So in, in general, we see here um, that the uh, algorithms under noisy conditions can be sometimes quite um, rough in a way. So, um, like, so we have, some, as you see here, like we have like um, different point clouds from from the same plants. Actually, as you see in the black points, these are the um, selected plant points from uh, from the same plant, and how does it uh, how it changed over the time? So, from 26 days, we have a really small plant, and 47 after 47 days, we had something like half a meter height of the plant. And there you see like, is it really complicated to estimate where does the plant start, where does it stop? And therefore, 
Um, there are also many different methods to use it. So this is um, one we also did in, um, we also explained here in, in one paper. I can uh, I see this forgot to up the source for it, but anyhow, if somebody is inter interested in it, I can forward it to you. Um, where we just got um, a craft cut algorithm to estimate where does the plant start and stop and how can we use a predefined position of a plant to estimate which plant points belong to to the actual leaves and all. And uh, so, but this is still also definitely a big part of research where we have to go through in the next years and what's a real challenge for estimating um, real values out of the scouting and anything what we see there. Yeah, now I talked uh, a lot about uh, different um, analysis methods what we have developed in our department for small robots and also options to use it. Uh, maybe in future there will be much more different ways maybe that we have more tools or doing more applicable parts for small robots. But at the moment I see more problem in the range of small machines and also the um, the way how the, the robot can move on an open field. So when we think about an open field, it has a lot of different um, areas. Sometimes it can be really smooth and really easy to move for a small robot and some others it can have big holes, um, and really wet conditions, muddy conditions, whatever, what makes it really hard for small robots. So there, and also the range um, on big fields makes it quite complicated to use them in uh, on, on big fields. But I think for small range fields, they're still applicable right now, the robots. So it's just a question if we see the first company selling something like this. So I think NIO is the first example of doing something, something similar um, for selling something like this. And I'm waiting forward to see the next companies um, putting their ideas on the market. But um, we were always thinking about how can we change this paradigm between Small machines, less force, less range, uh, and so on. And big machines doing all the work, but they are more dangerous and not that effective in a way. Um, and maybe not that uh, well suited to the task what they have to do. So we're doing some research on how can we change this paradigm that when we want to have a lot of traction and, and, and force, um, that we have also put a lot of weight on the machine. Like if you think about um, a normal wheel when it's taking um, or bringing force, um, attractive force, we have to put at least this, uh, the same weight on, on, on the wheel as it should pull afterwards. So if we have a, you could think about it like when you want to pull something around 200 kilos, we also want, uh, need a weight of what is at least 200 kilos of weight. This also brings a problem that we have um, a lot of force on, on, on the soil, so if soil compaction, any parts, and, and like in the losing conditions, it gets even worse. So if you think about like uh, normal conditions on a field in general, you get something like a traction coefficient for, of 0 0.4. So this means like that we have, um, like when we want to pull with, um, with 100 kilos, we have to put something like 400 kilos of weight on the machine that we can can push it. This is a lot, and we were thinking about how can we change this paradigm. Like, yeah, the easiest way maybe to do it is that you hook up yourself with the robot and, and the soil. And so actually, this is the basic behavior what also a human would do if he doesn't have enough traction. You want um, try to get some more traction away, and we try to integrate this part in the machine. So this is. Um, also, really nice, um, nice way to, to navigate. So you see here, like um, a single hook. What is what is going down here, uh, going into the field? And as soon as um, the slide is moving backwards, it will move the weight forwards. As soon as it's on the other part, it can move a slide back on the other side and hook into the soil again. This this makes this push and pull mechanism makes it possible for the device to um, pull. Much more track, um, pull much more than their own weight. Um, we also did some research on that. It's something around, in our case, with our prototype, around two times the, the own weight, but could be even much more higher depending how you def, um, define the system. Uh, this method was developed by a farmer in, um, 
in Mallorca actually who was interested in how to create more traction on a field with autonomous robots and she also created a pattern about it so uh, hopefully I hope to see from this technology more in future. Uh, anyhow, this is our prototype what we built here in Hohenheim. Um, this actually you see you have the caster wheels and a tool at the back part and there we have the spikes going into the soil and a slide moving back and forward in both directions. Um, in this case we had also for, uh, for tracking down to the position of the system a prison and we have linear actuators to push and pull down the, the hooks if we wanted to have them or if you need more traction or when you use them for steering. So we use a semi-active system in a, in a way that we uh, could push down the spikes um, on, on a part level that we, they are able to move freely in the middle position and then we can move them completely up if we don't want to use them in one part. So we have one at the left and one at the right part. And this already helps to um, do a lot of interesting work. So in this case you see um, a small setup what we had here with um, this was an older version of the machine, that's the reason why you don't have the linear actuators on it. Um, but you see like the driving motor is a really small one. So here we have something like um, less than 100 watts of uh, motor power and this is able to pull a mechanical tool for weeding for a complete crop row. In this case um, we had here, I think it should be um, yeah, I think four or five holes um, and the whole um, pull force of the system can increase at least double the weight of the whole weight. So the whole weight like this is weighing something around 100 kilos. It's moving slowly, but this already helps to um, improve definitely the performance of the system and makes it much more safe. So in a way like this is really slow. It doesn't makes uh, a lot of it doesn't need a lot of energy consumption um, and makes it possible to and do the work 24 hours a day and, and like on the power consumption what we measured in this device it was something around um, 100 uh, like 50 watts continuously uh, so it means like when we put a solar panel on it this would be even enough in Germany to provide enough solar power, power um, to get a complete power charge system with this mechanical device. Um, here's the one some experiments what we did so you see like the, the, the second version where we have an active system and pushing down. This is now a time lab to show in, in, in our soil bin to show a little bit how does the performance goes that we can even steer and turn around. Um, this is also an interesting part to use. Maybe there's some more options for it. Um, we're looking forward to have more time and more money to, to focus on this research topic. But anyhow, this is uh, showing that maybe we don't have to think always about a driving vehicle. Maybe it can be a push and pull mechanism or maybe something between um, to change um, the way how we think. This is the last slide. This is showing the graph um, about force measurements, what we did also. And it can create up to uh, 1.8 uh, 1 kilonewtons and this order the weight of 70 kilogram of the whole robot system. Um, this is actually already my last slide, so um, this is always um, a picture what I what I always like when I think about robots, the future of robotics in agriculture. Maybe we can can change the paradigm in the future with robotics that we don't think about big fields, monoculture, and anything else, that, but that we can use synergies between different plants that small robots can really do the the field work in a way and do it autonomously, maybe also maybe with some more intelligence that they do it right now. But uh, this is really futuristic. Maybe um, maybe in 50 years we could see something like this, maybe even earlier or maybe never, we don't know. Um, or maybe it will be on the other way that we can do it the other way and future robotics um, coming to agriculture in a way. And yeah, I found it quite interesting when I see now the image here, like you see here, a drone with, uh, with a picking device that um, I think a short time ago I saw um, a company um, or a small startup investing in picking apples with drones. So li really looking forward to see this uh, working in real. So let's see how the future will come. So.
So hope that there are some more questions. And then... Yeah, yeah, there are quite um, quite a few questions. So uh, I'm going to start with Santosh. Um, let me go back to where that was. All right, so the ISO bus is a standard for agricultural machinery, and how do you see systems that use ROS such as yours to be integrated into that standard? Um, I think that ROS is a definitely a powerful tool for robotics and also um, at least because of this open source. Um, and it helps in many cases to not do the same mistakes that other people do. So because it's already like um, you have a high connection with others in the community of robotics, and so it helps definitely to improve a lot of the system. But on the other side, I also have to say that um, dealing with ROS can be sometimes quite tricky, and um, sometimes in the, the, because you have so many options, makes it hard to focus on the real application. Um, I saw in many startups not using ROS anymore, um, at least like um, when they are want to have really sustainable and always working robots in a way. But I also know that it's definitely possible with ROS to, to go on this point. Um, it's, it's a question of, of um, how also like for, uh, for companies this really will work because um, as the open source software um, brings some, some problems for, for the companies to resell really the code. Um, so it's definitely, I'm definitely the wrong person to answer this question, uh, how this will be from law regulations and stuff like that. I think it will be also different from country to country. Um, but at least to bring the science and, um, or like the, the, um, the community forward, it's definitely really, really helpful. Okay. I'll go on to the next question from Matt. Is you mentioned safety, uh, security, and safety, and this is from the first half of the talk. Any lessons learned from your field testing? <laughs> A lot, for sure. Um, okay. <laughs> that's. Uh, I think this is another another hour of talk. If we start with all these parts, um, actually, there are many many issues with safety um, and also field tests and um, like. It's like always like it's, um, it's like Murphy's law, like what um, what can happen will happen in a way. So um, from safety parts, like, you know, just the basic part is um, on an open field where you just have like where you have flat ground, you can really easily make um, a system what will detect a human go, uh, coming close and will stop the machine. But as soon as um, uh, the crow stage will start and you have kind of, you know, like touching the leaves or touching branches and stuff like this get really, really difficult to first of all distinguish between the different objects. And um, also humans are, how to say, they're really interested in in, uh, in testing machines, I would say. So if you have a robot working somewhere in the field and uh, somebody sees the robot, he will try out to stop it. And he will try out when, when does it stop and when not in a way. So there's, there's always... <laughs> Um, a kind of uh, a playing around like with a dog in a way. So, uh, and this um, makes it also really, really tough for the engineers to think about all occasions, what could happen. And um, for sure there will be, um, how do you say, like there was never a system in, uh, good enough to, to deal with all circumstances for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's some questions from Corrado that I'm going to uh, some, uh, I'm going to con combine into two. On the introduction into miniature uh, or mini robots, the part on the field event, uh, the range for miniature robots is usually um, two hours, or I guess the duration for the robots. What about self-charging robots? And what about uh, or have you considered uh, or used collaborative? multiple mini robot systems to overcome range issues? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are uh, quite a lot of ideas about that. So like the, um, the easiest one is use cable, you know, like you have a power source in the back part, and then the robot is just pulling a cable over the, uh, over the part. Um, I just saw a short time ago from John Deere, uh, a tractor using this for electrification. And you can use it also for a small robot, but you also have the traction problem. 
Then um, charging, yes, it's definitely the easiest way, what you see all the lawnmowers um, that you have, but also this brings you to the point you have, in, you need an infrastructure in the field to do that. So if you want to have a charge, you need from part, time to time a charging station where the robot can go through. And this brings also some um, some problems for infrastructure to build it up. I think in some countries this can, can be easily done. In some others, on big fields, this can be really challenging, for sure. And also a question, how much does it really help in a way? So maybe um, the farmer have to bring like local station, like solar um, ch um, charge systems or stuff like this. It's definitely possible, um, but it's also a question if it's affordable, um, because this change of the infrastructure will also increase the costs for the robot. And yeah, sure, and also collaboration or just thinking about sharing batteries, sharing um, petrol or whatever um, could be an option. Um, but there is still like the issue, what do you do when one robot is stuck or like, you know, um, this um, like this cooperation is also a problem. How to share strengths, how to share um, the parts, how you can deal with it. I saw some research about it, but we never invested in, in this until now. All right, thank you. And I'm going to move to the next question. Is from Joe. What is the scope of micro aerial robots for monitoring crop health? Good question. <laughs> the scope. <laughs> um, let's say like this: it's, um, like crop monitoring or yield monitoring is always an interesting part. Um, and like, let's say like um, the problem is uh, when you have aerial vehicles. Um, it's definitely, um, or I would say, in many cases, it's already on the market. So using using drones. Um, um, it's uh, definitely um, there are definitely already available sy uh, systems what you can use, um, but the problems is also with their case that they have a big issue with range. So it's also with drones. It's also we have half an hour maybe of range. So there's definitely um, a limit how they can work, and there's also not a solved issue how um, also from law regulations with, with drones is even much more complicated to get law regulations or allowance to let them fly autonomously. Okay. Uh, and next uh, question is from Johannes, uh, and it's about the generating the meshes from point clouds. So at one point the meshes looks sort of bulky and then they were more fit to the plant. Um, so, did you use alpha shapes or some or uh, some other method, or, mm -hmm. or how did they? How did you or are they Poisson um, meshes or, or what algorithms did you use? Yeah, um, actually, like um, we did use the Poisson uh, mesh for uh, generating first of all a mesh in a way. And then, like, we just wanted to check out how accurate it is so that there was, in this case, some, what you see there, it was some hand trimming to see, um, or, or to do it in an automatic way, you should detect first the single plants, then um, take the single points out, uh, the single points of it, create a mesh point of this small one, and then use this afterwards for generating the whole point cloud. So in this way, um, what you saw in that picture, this was a hand trimming, actually. Um, just to okay. see how, how accurate it will be, um, but in for automating this this part, you really need to do it in a way that you are taking first a single plant detection, then create a mesh out of this, and you'll get better. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Uh, all right, I'm gonna do two people who haven't uh, asked a question yet. So Eshmael. Uh, how can the how oh, it's on the sensing of distinguishing crop plants and weeds? How are the robots distinguishing crop plants and weeds in the very early growth stage? He's um, interested in algorithms. Um, actually, in our case, we um, focused not so much on weeds, but more on the crops, um, because it's much easier to train an algorithm on um, already a, no, a known object. So 
that you, and also the good thing about crops is that they normally get planted in structures. So you have crop rows or have a, d a defined distance, what is almost all times quite similar in a way. And this we used in our case to first of all de um, define, um, like you can predefine what is the distance between the crop rows and also you know your camera position so you can define which area you should look at also you have an area of interest. And then you can afterwards, as soon as you detected your crop plants, you can afterwards distinguish what is left on, on green pixels. And then like the single um, areas you can define as roots. There are also, but there are also um, different, um, different ways uh, to, um, to do that. Um, also with, um, with, yeah, sure that you train your algorithm for, for different plant, uh, for single plants, but, uh, or for single weeds, um, but we didn't investigate in that part. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last question, so we, we're running significantly um, late. We're, we're about <laughs> 20 minutes over, so I'm just going to take uh, Timo Oksanen's question. He, his is, are your students ready for this year's field robot event? Sorry, once again, didn't get a question. He's asking, are your students ready for this year's field robot? <laughs> yeah, they're working on it, let's say, like this. So I uh, hope to see Timo soon <laughs> in the field robot. And okay. uh, no, they, yeah, we're working on it, at least. Um, we got the last version running, but we did some mechanical improvements. So um, they are still waiting for some parts, and hopefully we get the first trials for testing the algorithms. Uh, next week on Monday, actually. Okay, that was that was an informal question. Exactly. We didn't have to answer <laughs> it technically. Okay, so with that, thank you everyone who stayed around. And um, as before, if you have any feedback about this webinar, especially lo the logistical items, please let me know. If you have any questions for David. Um, please email him. If you have uh, trouble finding David's email, you can contact me and I will send it on. Thank you very much, David. You're welcome. All right. Thanks goodbye. See you.